We have visitors this morning who have come to, because they're good friends of Craig Hawkins, we welcome you. If you look around this room, you'll see pictures that Craig drew. Uh, for 44 weeks last year, we worked through the Jesus Storybook Bible. And beginning over here, before the creation, and all the way over here to the end, Craig, in almost real time, illustrated each of those messages. Now, this morning, we have invited Craig to talk to us about how following Christ informs his vocation as an artist. One of the things that was recovered in the Protestant Reformation was the reminder that every vocation, every job, every task that you do to earn your daily bread is a spiritual vocation as it brings glory to God. I don't know about you, but I've decided that air conditioning makes life in the South possible. <laughs> and that man that fixed my air conditioner two or three years ago, he made me bring glory to God for cool air. <laughs> Some of you are able to take uh, things and make things of beauty out of them. You're able to fix things that are broken. You are able uh, to take that which you provide to our culture and Connect it with the people who need it. Every job before Jesus is a valued vocation. Now, it just so happens that Craig's vocation involves the ability to look at things, to portray them in various medium, to move our eyes, to see sometimes beyond what is there in nature to make us think about what's being portrayed. And in each of these pictures, if you take time after church today, if you haven't looked at them all, you can pick out the story from the Bible that's illustrated, and you can be dr drawn closer to the truth. So, Craig, come up here. I'm going to pray for you. We welcome you to this pulpit, and we thank God for your ability, your calling, and that you use these to the glory of God. Would you join me as we pray? Father, we thank you for our brother Craig. We thank you, Lord, for his love for you that he has uh, taken years to hone his art, to sharpen it, and he uses it in your service. We thank you, Lord, that uh, you have done in him what you've done in all of us, taken us out of the kingdom of darkness, placed us in the kingdom of your light, so that we can bring glory to you by the works of our hands. Lord, I pray you give him confidence this morning. Help him to share uh, words born in heaven and expressed here. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. All right. Well, good morning. Um, as you have already know, or most of you may know, my name is Craig Hawkins. Um, a quick introduction. Uh, here's a condensed list of roles that I've been entrusted to fulfill, uh, as well as my website and social media name at the bottom if you want to see more of what I share with you today. Uh, each role here is intertwined with others in various ways, but for today I've been honored with the opportunity to speak about the intersection of these two. Ta -da. There. Um, <clears throat> I've been a follower of Christ since 1998, and although I can't remember a time in my life where I wasn't drawn or drawing or, or making something, um, I've professionally considered myself an artist since 1999. As an artist, I'm primarily captivated with the disciplines of drawing and painting. Uh, as a follower of Christ, I'm primarily captivated with the overarching story of God's love, intention, and purpose with mankind, embodied and expressed through the person of Jesus Christ. But before I go any for further, I, I do want to say thank you. I need to express my thanks to you as, as Christ's Fellowship Church. Um, you, as a church, have been so supportive and loving, not just to my family, uh, but also to my artistic expression. Whether it's been through dialogue with you about my artwork adorning the walls of the building or joining me in 2016 for a year-long collaboration with Pastor Ken and the Jesus Storybook Bible. Uh, <clears throat> words don't really express it well, but thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I've, thanks. <laughs> um, I felt activated and enriched spiritually um, and artistically uh, with your incorporation and acceptance of my talent. Your interest and support means more to me than I can explain.
Um, and all your support has now led to an invitation to address how my worldview as a follower of Christ influences my life as an artist. Uh, it's a privilege and an honor to try and verbalize that today. So, I'm going to start. I'll wait for the slides to catch up. Oh, one before that. There we go. Um, I'll start with a statement about my work and then attempt to show you a behind-the-scenes perspective of my artistic process. After walking you through some of my work, I'd like to tell you why I think we're all creatives and cultivators in some way, shape, or form. In general, and here's my statement, in general, my art consists of humble attempts to ask the right questions and plant seeds of beauty. I collect moments of personal exploration and revelation and try to visually give them away as a drawing or a painting. Hoping to motivate the viewer to reassess things typically taken for granted, I see art as a catalyst for great discussion. Art naturally asks questions. Questions that I have and lessons I learn uh, develop the content of my art. There we go. Um, as I grow, my art grows. Uh, my intentional following of Jesus determines what content I entertain and invest my time in at the table of my ideas. So let's start with a series that re that's relatively easy to connect with scripturally. Um, with a series like the Bread Series, I have found myself intentionally praying over a passage or story from the Bible, and it seems as if God directly communicates a phrase or a, a picture in my head that opens up a new idea or a new perspective awaiting exploration. So then I, I draw and, and write about it in my sketchbook. Starting in 2014, the beauty of God led me to seek out biblical references of bread within the collection of 66 books historically recognized as the Holy Bible. I began to see the Last Supper as the ultimate example of performance art, uniting the past, present, and future into one moment in time. Now, I've, I've got a, I don't know if the slide's on here or not, I can't remember which version this is, but I, I have a, um, a Webster's definition here of what performance art is I thought would be helpful. Oh, good, it is there. Uh, performance art is non-traditional, is a non-traditional art form, often with political or topical themes that typically features a live presentation to an audience or onlookers, as on a street, and draws on such arts as acting, poetry, music, dance, or painting. I say this about The Last Supper because of the depth of meaning and symbolism The Last Supper represents to the disciples and all who believe in Christ. Provision seemed uh, to be at the heart of bread in biblical contexts. So looking back to my series, um, works in this series revolve around the question of hunger's present and ongoing, thirst's physical and spiritual. Bread can speak to an abundance and the power to provide while hinting at a bread eternally provisional and one who answers the supreme hunger of life. The Last Supper speaks to Christ himself being the sacrifice for our sins and nourishment for our groaning that gives us all eternal significance and a reunited relationship with our Creator now and beyond death. So you can see that was, the, that was the preliminary kind of sketch. And then the next slide here is uh, the end result, which is this painting is actually in the, in the little classroom behind the wall back here. Um, in its initial sketch, this painting titled New Covenant focused on Christ's words. This is my body broken for you, and this is my blood shed for you. Compositionally, I chose to arrange these sacrificial symbols to reference the Abrahamic covenant found in the book of Genesis chapter 15. Abraham followed God's instruction to split animal carcasses and create a ceremonial agreement between the two of them. Passing between the sacrifice committed that person as responsible to follow through the stated agreement even to the point of death. God alone passed between the pieces to establish an unconditional covenant with man and did not allow Abraham uh, to play any additional role. Through Jesus, God fulfilled that covenant with his death on the cross. <clears throat> the, the way bread is referenced through Christ in the Gospels is fascinating to me. The common sharing of meals with Jesus is an affirmation of his humanity, of our materiality, even as he, his resisting the temptation to turn stones to bread reminds us that we are more than we eat. While referencing a contemporary version of bread, I began to envision this temptation and, and paint a stone turning into bread. I have found that Christ offers a space where the ordinary and the ephemeral and the extraordinary and eternal intersect. 
I employed a traditional process of underpainting for this work to build up levels of glaze and detail until I arrived at a convincing image. Now, for those of you who may not know, glazing is a, a painting technique that involves layering translucent layers of color to change like the tint, the tone, the shade, or even the hue um, of a color. Um, so as you can see in the slide, my son Lincoln took part and helped me with, with the underpainting here. <laughs> and he's waving. There you go. All right, thanks. <laughs> Um, and so the, the next slide is the finished piece, which is, uh, is hanging above the couch in, um, in the hallway here. This painting depicts the, the what-if scenario. What if Jesus turned stone to bread during the temptation in the desert? I mean, surely he could imagine the process. Surely he could satisfy physical need immediately. But Jesus saw through the temptation, answering that humanity does not live on bread alone, but from every word that comes from the mouth of God. The work hopes to offer imaginative food for thought. Christ continues to feed and care for his creation, working within the loving purposes of God, continually redirecting us to, what, to that which ultimately gives life. It is the wondrous power of God that instructs our birth, growth, and continued existence. I'm waiting for the slide to change. There you go, sorry. And, and continued existence in daily life. The creative process of photosynthesis is in itself uh, God's extended breath of life into the world. Jesus turned water to wine, or multiplying bread, continues to speak of God as a creator, and creation is filled with the glory of a creative God. So God creates DNA and provides inherent instruction for a strand to duplicate itself. Depending on the type of cell housing the DNA, somewhere between 1 and 24 hours a cell multiplies by division. On a larger scale, plants and insects, animals, and people multiply. There's a language for multiplication, and the author is our Heavenly Father. In John chapter 6, Jesus fed a multitude of over 5,000 people with just two fish and five barley loaves. With the help of C.S. Lewis, I've been able to appreciate that God performs great and wonderful things like turning water into wine or multiplying fish and barley on a regular basis through biological processes. For this piece, I composed uh, slices of bread, hoping a slice would be easier to recognize than a loaf from a distance, um, and two fish in a way that mimics the anaphase of mitosis, which is part of a cell cycle, and you can see the, the diagram below and then the piece of art above here. I don't pretend to understand Jesus' miracle. But I do believe that the same one who multiplied fish and bread to feed us also works in us to physically grow us and spiritually mature us. As he calls himself in John 6, 35, Jesus is the bread of life, and he fills more than our stomachs. He defines all other hungers for us and fulfills our deepest needs of meaning and, <clears throat> of meaning and belonging. He does this with abundance, and it's been his style since the beginning of time. Now, some of my work is less obvious um, in terms of connecting it with scripture. Um, it's more subjective and, and, well, yeah. So we're moving on to the next series here. It's, it's Genesis comes out of sharing ideas, talking about life's challenges in some, uh, with someone, or quietly driving home from work when something resonates and I begin to explore a question or a concept and see where it leads. The box series began with a question. Why and how do we hide? I wanted to deal with isolation and compartmentalizing. Veiling and distance from the viewer became significant while questioning what feels safe and comfortable. I asked friends to wear huge cardboard boxes of my own construction and model for me. Uh, these became my references or my reference material for, for paintings I would do, and this is one of the, one of the photos. Um, it was, it was pretty ridiculous, uh, <laughs> and we had, we had a, lot of, a lot of laughs intermixed with awkward moments of silence when I was like, okay, hold, hold, hold that, just, just be quiet, hold on. So it, it was kind of weird, but um, as I continued in, though, I, I saw the boss as an empty container for meaning. Um, the wrong slide. Oh, there it is. Okay. Uh, a metaphorical void for the viewer to fill with his or her own projections. I believe we were created with the need for community and communication beyond ourselves. So in contrast, I created scenarios where the figure was clearly limited by uh, the level of interaction they could have with another human uh, being unless they shared a box with someone. 
The metaphor of the box and spaces broadened as the series progressed. As viewers began to ask what the box meant and what was going on inside, the planes of color became psychological. The figures were inhabiting a form of faith, lies, identity, limitations, secrets, and false, a false belief system, or even a limited perspective. One application of these ideas could explore trust and obedience. Willful, uncoerced obedience depends on trust. Trust for honesty, trust for fairness, trust for compassion, and trust for justice. History reveals God to be trustworthy in our willingness to trust God as inconsistent. Choosing to walk around in a self-constructed box of our own prejudice will perilously veil us from the heart of God. When our heart harbors hate, revenge, or prejudice, we forsake the faithful love of God towards us and towards others. Our us versus them scenario must break down and become an us for them mindset. Mistrust will infest a heart that doesn't do that. So let's choose justice, mercy, and compassion towards others. I propose that uh, these box paintings can ask each and every one of us two personal questions. One, will we be inclusive or exclusive when sharing God's love? And two, will we react with fear or respond with God's love in the face of distrust, revenge, and anger? See, the arts tend to plug into, indicate, or question our life experiences, and I think this is the limit of fine art as evangelical. The responsibility of prescription or personal application from art is left to the viewer because art asks questions better than it gives answers. Sharing my experiences with others by posing questions with my art uh, has appeared to be a natural outward flow of my Christian worldview. It's not, only, it's not the only way, and it certainly has its limits. Um, but as an artist who follows Jesus, it's my continued and sincere attempt to do everything to the glory of God. Are you familiar with this quote? Uh, it's from the 1981 movie Chariots of Fire. Uh, it says, I believe God made me for a purpose, but he also made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. I feel the same way about drawing and painting as this character feels about running. I've recently begun to understand why I feel this way. I think we're all creatives and cultivators in some way, shape, or form. So uh, let's look at Genesis chapter 1 to see what I mean by that. So here's Genesis 1. Um, <clears throat> in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness covered the surface of the watery depths, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Now there's something here I want to point out. Uh, Genesis describes an account of God creating and bringing order out of emptiness. I recently learned the phrase formless and empty translates from the Hebrew word or phrase tohu vavohu. Uh, it's kind of fun to say. It's got a rhyme and rhythm to it. It seems to have stuck with me. Um, Traditionally translated with chaos and emptiness in mind, we could preserve that uh, rhythm and rhyme and say uh, wild and wasteland. It's apparently a tough phrase to define, though. And here's a description I found from an online Hebrew school. It says the, the original Hebrew describes the condition of the earth as tohu vabohu, which literally means an empty desert and is another word for a desert without water. The English translation makes one imagine a total mess and chaos, but in contrast, the the Hebrew description does not illustrate a mess, but rather describes an empty, waterless land, a land without mountains, trees, rivers, and so on, a land that awaits to be developed. I, I really like that uh, last part. It's, it's waiting on something. Um, whether stressing chaos or empty, waterless land, God is still displayed as creator and even a cultivator. To me, it's interesting to focus on the land as awaiting something. <laughs> so... Um, for anyone here familiar with crocheting, uh, Donna has uh, recently started this. Um, here's an illustration that I get. Um, it's way more than this for sure, but you see on the left-hand side the tangled web of craziness that I can't seem to explain, and I don't think Donna can explain when it happens. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, th so there's this craziness here. Um, and uh, when, when this happens, uh, to fix it, it takes like hours of, of reorganizing and knotting. And I, I've done this uh, when I've seen it happen to Donna because I like puzzles. But um, so we get through it, and, and then it's developed and it's organized in a good way for a purpose. 
Um, that to me is the process of tohu, tohu vavohu cultivated into something it could not have become by itself. So either way, there's this, there's this something that will not do anything unless someone steps in. So back to Genesis, as we see in verses 3 through 25, God is dividing, God's organizing and creating uh, broad strokes, developing more detail as the account progresses. And in verses 26 through 28, God creates humans specifically in the image of God. Uh, to go along with this, um, I, I do want to show you one of the paintings. It's not here at the church. Uh, and it's actually rather old, but it's a painting of, of day five of creation, where the birds and the fish originate on the horizon as if the waves of water double as the sound waves of God's voice. Um, well, so we're, we're going to talk about Genesis here with, with the image of God. The, the point of an image is, the, is to represent a reality, but the phrase image of God is also significant. We see it in Genesis 1.27. The same phrase was used by Assyrians assigning rule and authority to their elite. It was a title denoting the physical representation or embodiment of a god. It's also a reference to idols. Uh, idols like the Lamassu statues used by Assyrian kings to mark the presence of their rule. The human heads were, um, were portraits of the king warding off enemies of the king. Think about the role of these idols for just a second. No wonder the second commandment forbids any graven images or idols. God already did this when he made us. In the right relationship with him, we point to his authority and rule. But what I'm really getting at is this. God made us to represent him, and, we see Adam and as we see Adam and Eve in the garden, we are invited to cultivate and rule with him. Psalm 8 is an Israelite's reflection on the Genesis story. With wonder, fascination, and praise, they realize God doesn't want us to be bystanders, but to join with him, building and developing something. We wouldn't be giving God glory if we didn't acknowledge his role in our stewardship of his creation. Uh, Psalm 8, verses, uh, starting at verse 4 through 9, says, What is man that you remember him, the son of man that you look after him? You made him little less than God and crowned him with glory and honor. You made him lord over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet, all the sheep and oxen, as well as the animals in the sky, the birds of the sky and the fish of the sea that pass through the currents of the seas. You can see the reflection of the Genesis story going through there. Yahweh, our Lord, how magnificent is your name throughout the earth. So, <clears throat> if we're invited into God's way of ruling and subduing, do we do this? Uh, well, yes and no. Uh, by default, we rule, with, we rule and subdue. It's kind of just the way we're made. But we take what's in front of us, and we make new combinations, arrange information, that kind of stuff. But... We tend to do these things bypassing the love and will of God, preferring to do things our way. And we do that because we are in the diminished form of what we are meant to be. Genesis chapter 3 explains this uh, with the temptation and fall of man. And sin is the problem here. To quote Malcolm Muggeridge, the depravity of man is at once the most empirically verifiable reality, but at the same time the most intellectually resisted fact. The, represent, the representative creatures God made to join with him and meaningfully reflect his character and love decided their desires, their curiosities, and observations revealed more than what God had commanded. Not trusting but disobeying God, humans were expelled from the Garden in Eden, of Eden, and we've never been the same since. We're always putting our ways above God's ways. We have a deeply rooted sin problem that breaks our relationship with God, but Jesus Christ's life, death, and resurrection has made it possible to, to renew that relationship once again. Colossians makes this clear. This is uh, chapter 1, verses 13 through 20. Uh, he has rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the Son he loves. We have redemption, the forgiveness of sins, in him. He is the image of the invisible God the firstborn over all creation, for everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and by him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. 
For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile everything to himself by making peace through the blood of his cross, whether things on earth or things in heaven. God wants to build something with us, and he has gone to great lengths to make this possible. He wants to share the cultivation and growth of this world. Our representation of him is our purpose and ultimate pleasure. We also have an example to follow through Jesus as the image of God. Our relationship with Christ is key. We will reflect his importance and glorify God the more we get to know Jesus. Please permit me to read this quote by author Andy Crouch. It says, <clears throat> I wonder what we Christians are known for in the world outside our churches. Are we known as critics, consumers, copiers, condemners of culture? I'm afraid so. Why aren't we known as cultivators? People who tend and nourish what is best in human culture, who do the hard and painstaking work to preserve the best of what people before us have done. Why aren't we known as creators, people who dare to think and do something that has never been thought of or done before, something that makes the world more welcoming and thrilling and beautiful? Our relationship with God is of paramount importance. God is inviting us all to join with him and reflect his character and love for the world. Uh, there's also recently, there was a quote by Martin Luther that I, that I heard. Um, it says, uh, God, doesn't, oh, God doesn't need our good works, our neighbor does. Uh, I think that fits really well here. Um, we are all creative and capable of cultivating based on our identity found in God through Jesus Christ. Everybody, everybody is creative, and I would argue this because our daily lives always require some form of problem solving. I'm not saying everyone here can or should draw or paint, but we can organize, we can repair, we can cook, we can clean, we can teach, we can wash, serve, budget, plan, reproduce, grow, enrich, compose, sing, build, make. So I think you get the point. <laughs> um, and yes, uh, you know, draw and paint or you know, dance or sculpt, but. Um, uh, we reflect our creator when we do this, all of these things in meaningful ways that produce something good. So I'll, I'll end with this. Uh, God loves us, and he's proven it with Jesus. He's inviting us to a life consumed with loving him and loving people. So let's be who we were created to be. Ephesians 2.10 states, we, For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Um, and lastly here, this is more like a PS to stick on at the end here. Um, I'd like to invite you to be part of my creative process. I have several evolving projects that require more than myself to create, which seems to be a common thing the further I go with, with my artistic endeavors. I can't, I can't be a lonely artist in a box. I have to interact with other people, which is good for me. Um, but uh, so with these uh, evolving projects uh, that require more than myself I'm always looking for others to collaborate with so uh, please talk to me later if you'd like to know any more about any one of these four projects on the screen one's about hymns in the community uh, one's an idea of drawing portraits of in inmates at the prison another one's about how confession shapes us and uh, the last one down at the bottom there is about how uh, Jesus in his kingdom and his ways uh, seem so upside down to our culture. So um, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we praise you for the works of your hands, your purposes, and the grace you extend to us through Jesus. You invite us to create and cultivate with you every day of our lives from the little everyday tasks to major investments of our time, talents, and treasures. Help us yield to your ways accept your salvation through Jesus and trust you with all that we are. Help us follow the example your son Jesus is to us. May we love you with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, everything we are, and love our neighbors as ourself. Whatever we do today and the rest of this week, may we intentionally do it in a way that honors you. In Jesus' name I ask all these things. Amen.